Welcome to the panel number 30, entitled The French Revolution, Revisions and Precisions. I would like to begin, first of all, by thanking David and his team for um, arranging to do this. I appreciate how much work they have had to put into an extraordinary effort. We're all disappointed we can't go to New Zealand, but this is quite, quite a thrill to be able to contact colleagues this way. Um, I th the rules of the game that we have we've established among ourselves is that we're going to try and have individual discussions and then have papers blend together in common themes. And Ian has, a, has agreed to take uh, the first question, I'll ask the first question and we'll go from there. Everyone will get, get to participate. Ian Collar, University of California, Irvine. So I'll just start by int introducing myself and I think the others are gonna introduce themselves briefly as well. Um, I'm Ian Collar from, as Don said, University of California, Irvine. Uh, I've just published a book called Muslims and Citizens, uh, Islam, Politics and the French Revolution. And I've been talking in my paper about the ways in which these connections to Islam and particularly the Prophet Muhammad were used uh, around particularly the events of Thermidor and ways of rethinking and reconceiving uh, Robespierre's relationship to the terror. So I think Justine was next. Okay. Um, hi, my name is uh, Justine Carey Miller, and I am a second year PhD student at Florida State University. I'm studying with Professor Kathy McClive and Rafe Lafarb. Um, my, the paper that I'm presenting today is about uh, prostitution in 18th century France, and specifically uh, representations of, uh, of prostitution and attempts to, to control it. Um, in general, I study uh, early modern France and gender and sexuality and also the history of medicine. Yeah. Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Kaiser, uh, formerly of the University of Arkansas Little Rock. Uh, two years ago, uh, I moved uh, to the University of Maryland, where I'm currently a senior lecturer. And uh, I've been working for many years. Uh, on the Franco-Austrian exchange at the end of the second half of the 18th century, uh, in particular connection to Marie Antoinette uh, and the uh, con continuity of French foreign policy from the old regime into the French Revolution. Okay, Bob. Hi, I'm Bob Blackman. Uh, I'm a Elliott Professor of History at Hampton Sydney College, a small liberal arts college for men in the center, right in the center of Virginia. I've just uh, published a book last year called uh, 1789, The French Revolution Begins. And I really have focused most of my career on uh, 1789. Uh, I'm planning to move away from 1789, but today's paper definitely stays inside of 1789. I look at mainly concepts of political representation, and I'm uh, increasingly interested in the, the ways in which uh, rhetoric and events interact, and I'm trying to come up with ways to discuss uh, which has the whip hand at different times, or what people are thinking or what's happening around them. Okay, and I'm Don Sutherland. I've been at the University of Maryland for over 30 years until I retired two years ago. Right, I was still working, working very hard on a new project about Paris in 1789, specifically about the origins of violence from below and how that shapes the general overall tone for 1789. I think you can see a drift of how, that's, how that work is shaping up in my paper that I've given today. Uh, Ian has agreed to start us off with a general question and then we'll bounce from there. Yeah, so I mean, I was very excited by all of these papers and I saw so many connections to the interest that I have, obviously with, with, with Bob's discussion, the connections between uh, the Catalan conspiracy and these issues around the Prophet Muhammad uh, were really very obvious. Um, but what I saw in a kind of general sense and what I was really interested to hear others speak about was this new sense of the relationship between rhetoric and events, the way that rhetoric functions as an enunciative practice, not just as words on a page, but actually does things, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that it actually shapes the eventness of events that and it's not just a, a it's not just opposing discourse on one hand and circumstances on the other but that there's this much more complicated relationship between the two and 
some of these discussions in recent times about emotional communities, I, I felt like some of the ideas that were coming out of these papers were moving beyond that to, to, to recognize this very specifics of a revolutionary situation as rhetorical strategies suddenly change and are adopted differently. And I saw that in Justine's discussion about, about uh, prostitution and about these utopian projects. And I was really interested in this question about the articles, <laughs> the form of the articles and how that kind of transferred from these texts into the Cahier de Doléance and the Declaration of Rights of Man. Bob's, obviously Bob's discussions of the Catalan conspiracy. Tom's discussion about the diplomatic war and how it relates to the threat of real war and how these, all these crises become entangled around the late 1780s. Don's discussion of people and populace and how events are shaped by whether they are understood to have been acted by the people or by the populace. Uh, and also in Linda and Marsha Frey's, the shift from diplomat to protected spies, but also the rejection of, of a particular form of language and rhetoric that was recognized as being acceptable for diplomacy, this politesse. So I, I, I wondered if others perhaps had something to say about how their work connects rhetoric and events. Perhaps Bob would want to start. Yeah, I was going to say, my, I, I, I'm really interested in that. And um, I think my paper really dovetails well with, uh, with Dawn's because the deputies are dealing with the aftermath of events like the sacking of San Lazar. And they're really having trouble figuring out uh, it, in the debate of August 31st, whether they're dealing with uh, a reasonable people who will support good reform or there is some kind of, of populace that is simply being directed by some uh, shadowy figure. I don't think that they're at this point very good at imagining that the people of Paris can have their own mind and are really interested in, in things that the members of the assembly don't want for them. And so in that sense, they're, they're struggling towards a rhetorical project in which the people have a voice that is other than the voice of these elite males. And I thought, uh, I thought, and Don in particular, the, the notion of the distinction between searching for arms and vandalism uh, at the, at the San Lazar compound was, it was really fascinating to me. There's, uh, there's violence that's acceptable, there's violence that isn't acceptable. And searching for arms is acceptable in the wider context of trying to defend the city against the royal siege. Looting and especially destroying religious objects makes no sense to the, to the, the, the journalists and those deputies who did comment on it. And so it's condemned. So there's a good violence and a bad violence, which you can see the next day in, in, in July 14th, in that the, the contortions that people have to go through to justify the, the execution and beheading of Delaunay um, is, is, an example, is an example of this. Delaunay basically comes down to Delaunay deserved it. Others' uh, killings later in the street is much more ambiguous. They didn't, didn't obviously deserve it. I uh, think in Betty de Sauvigny and Foulon de Douai uh, on the 22nd of July. They, they may have deserved it, they may not have deserved it, but the way that people carried out the killing is unacceptable. So there's a lot of, a lot of difficult, as Bob says, a lot of things that are, are in play here and people trying to come up with a strategy to understand the events that are outside of their control and, and, and that come on them very suddenly and unpredictably. That it's that unpredictability. The attempt to make a conspiracy out of it seems to me is an attempt to portray it as predictable and in that sense, controllable. And well, I, they, that, had, they had the conspiracy laid a hand with the Orleans conspiracy on, on the October days. They're, they're absolutely convinced that that's what it is. Um, and the, the enquête of the Châtelet, which goes very deep, five, 600 pages into the investigation of of the, of the October days is, starts off with the, the, the clear assumption that the Orleanists are behind it with, with the aid of Mirabeau as the kind of um, executioner, a person who executes the, the events. And they simply cannot understand um, the, the origin of the October days in the Palais Royal and how that came about. And Bob talks about some of this when he talks about the Marquis de Saint-Rouge. 
this is uh, the October days is about the fifth or sixth attempt to uh, invade Versailles. It's not the only, the fifth or sixth. Uh, the, all have been thwarted up until that point, including Santa Luzia, which is the most spectacular, spectacular suppression so far. And the October days gets out of hand, and it's, uh, that's because the Dingulan, the men of the Palais Royal, are strategizing about how to get past the bridges of, of, of the Seine and the royal garrisons between Pont de Sèvres and Versailles. They finally work it out by, by engaging the women radicals. And the women radicals are essential, to, as everyone says, essential to the success of the affair. I was wondering whether, I was just interested in, in for Justine's work, I just again with this question of this kind of rhetorical shift in the ways of understanding prostitution and just I mean because I guess we're interested in the in the revolutionary period uh, do you see that as a kind of continuity then into the revolution and onwards or do you feel that it shifts again and how does it what kind of impact does it have on 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 the objects of this <laughs> of this new rhetoric about prostitution um so we definitely, the revolutionary period, as far as prostitution is concerned, is definitely a transition from the, 18, the early modern model, which was a much more casual version of prostitution, meaning that women could move easily move in and out of prostitution. Um, and that's one thing that the texts uh, that I study want to change, is that they want to make prostitution a, profession, a, a professional activity, meaning that, you know, it would, be, it would become a full-time job and there would really no, be no way for these women to, to, to change uh, or to get out of it. Um, and, and that's kind of what happens in the 19th century, where prostitution becomes much more professionalized. Um, and therefore, it's it enables the police to, um, um, to arrest prostitutes and to control them much more because, because it is their main occupation and therefore um, it's more visible that, that these women partake in prostitution. Um, so I think it is interesting that these texts did not have any um, immediate uh, consequences in the world of prostitution in the 18th century, meaning that these projects that these men described never really came to fruition. But I'd say that the rhetoric behind it and the idea of professionalizing it and uh, controlling it even more, that definitely translated into a new model of prostitution into the 19th century. And you said that some actually went into the, that there were actually references in the Cahier de Doléans. Yes, yes. So, Rétif de la Bretonne's Parthenon. Partenon, uh, were, were referenced in the Cahiers de Doléances. Um, prostitution in general was referenced in the Cahiers de Doléances, not very much, because um, but there were instances where people asked for more control. Um, and it seems that that was one model that people, uh, that people thought could, could become, that was plausible, that could come into action in Paris. I thought one of the interesting things about your paper, Justine, was how the 19th century prostitutional regime in terms of brothels and that network of brothels was imagined almost a hundred years before it was implemented. An example of how ideas can have an absolute effect on, 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 on actually events and institutions. And what I was going to ask you also, and what struck me knowing a little bit about 19th century prostitution, whether it, would, whether it was resisted, whether this attempt to control and to police prostitution was, was resisted as it was later in the 19th century, where the, the women themselves re rebelled against the idea, eventually got totally fed up with the amount of repression that was being visited upon them and brought the regime to an end, brought the regime of prostitution, organized prostitution to an end. Um, so for the 18th century, it was, um, I'd say the action of the police, they were, they were very different depending on the kind of prostitution that we're talking about. Um, so they had networks of surveillance for, for many women who partook in prostitution. Um, and they were definitely much more active in arresting women, uh, street walkers, as opposed to courtesans or kept women. Um, but there was, so it was this, this sort of in bet somewhere between tolerance and and uh, and arrests so so depending because mostly women were 
arrested for crimes of debauchery or you know theft or so crimes that w that could be um consequences of prostitution but not often for the actual uh the the actual offense of prostitution um so i think that that in the 18th century women had a lot more options and, and a lot more um um how do i say this um they could more easily avoid uh arrest because they were not in brothels like you said they were in the 19th century so i think that they had more options and that the repression of the police was more um more about these other crimes than actually about uh arresting them for prostitution i was wondering about um the, the writers you have are all male, I assume, anonymous, we're not sure, I suppose. Um, but uh, what about women's voices on prostitution in the 18th century? Um, how are they looking at this differently? Um, so there, as I'm sure you uh, assume, there are very few primary sources written by women on prostitution. Uh, most of the books uh, and the uh, studies that historians have written are based on police records. Um, and uh, so I can think of a, a couple exceptions. Uh, Catherine Norberg uh, wrote a chapter uh, based on the, the records of a female uh, madam. But um, as far as we know, uh, I mean, there, there's not, there's, there are not many ways that for us to get to the, these women's voices. Uh, I know, uh, Clyde Plumosil, in her book, she includes, uh, her book is about prostitution during the revolution, and she includes letters of prostitutes who were arrested um, and who contested their, their arrest, saying that, you know, that they, um, that they deserved their, their rights and that they, they, they had a right to appeal to their arrest. Um, but yeah, these are the only instances where I can that I can think of that where we have texts or uh, written by women of the time. So very few. Oh, I, I have one final question for you, mm -hmm. Justine. Yes. Uh, I can drag high politics into anything. It'll be <laughs> enough time. I I was fascinated by your renditions of these different works, and I wondered if you saw in them any reference to uh, public opinion regarding Louis the Fifteenth considering that he was one of the uh, most high profile uh, consumers of prostitution, uh, especially late in, in his reign. And how is it, is there any chance that these uh, attempts to reform prostitution include in them criticism of Louis the 15th and of the monarchy? Um, so like I mentioned in my paper, most of where the, the authors reveal where they're coming from regarding prostitution and, and their, uh, their biases they, in their introduction. And so a lot of them talk about, uh, so I split them into two groups as you've read in my paper. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones who want prostitution to keep going, just their control and those who want to eradicate it. Um, and in those who want to eradicate it, the reasons that they state, they're mostly about, so about uh, morals and about the spread of venereal diseases. Um, there, I don't. I, I didn't see any references or even um, hidden references to uh, to the king or even to the nobility. Um, and for those who want to keep prostitution going, mostly they praise love, they praise women, they praise sex. So I don't. So they wouldn't have. So on their side, they, there wouldn't be. I think any hidden criticism. But but it's possible that they didn't dare put it in their introductions or didn't dare put it in their texts, but yeah. Well, there certainly was a literature about Louis XV's the use of the Parc aux Serres. Uh, there's even one pamphlet that attributes the deficit, uh, in, I think it was in 1790, or published in 1789, 1790, that attributes it deliberately to the cost of the Parc aux Serres, how many women per week he was, uh, shall we say, employing how much it cost the French state. They did a multiplication. It came always up to a billion livres. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's, it's tied into the whole bankruptcy issue and 
the corruption of the courts and so on and so forth. But I don't know whether that relates to prostitution as it was currently, you know, commonly practiced outside the court, which might be a, a special yeah. case. And, and the, these texts are mostly, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, these, texts are, these texts are mostly focused on streetwalkers, um, so women who during the day would have any sort of other job. Um, they don't address courtesans or kept mistresses or elite prostitutes very much. Um, so I think maybe that's why uh, that, that's not so much an issue. I was going to shift gears and ask another question, which we can start with Tom and I can ties in with some of the other papers. That is the, the relationship between Tom's discussion of the Bavarian exchange and the crisis that that provoked in European power relationships. And his other work on astrophobia in the culture as a whole. Was the, could you relate those two things together? The, 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 the culture of, of diplomatic affairs as opposed to diplomatic affairs? Um, well, the Bavarian exchange was one very particular moment, but it, it's, it's, as I tried to suggest a little at the beginning, at the end, it fits into a long arc of transition. Um, and I think the, the larger issue in that, that relates to some of the other papers, if I could sort of move it in that direction, is that while there was lots of reasons to worry about what was going inside France, there was also a lot of reasons to worry about what was going, France's relationship with the rest of the world at this particular point. And what one gets in the course of the 1780s and the paper I wrote addresses one particular aspect or moment of, of that is the fact that France was no longer um, as uh, bulking as important in, the, in European affairs as it had under Louis XIV and, and, and there was a gradual slippage over the course of the 18th century. Um, and I guess what my paper uh, touches on specifically um, is the vulnerability of French borders. Um, how you know, the French had not had to worry oh, a great deal in the 18th century. Uh, there was an invasion by Austria in the War of the Austrian Succession, but that was relatively brief. But by and large, they had been relatively secure behind their borders. What happens when you start believe, beginning to believe that your borders aren't secure any longer, right? Um, it seems to me that helps to breed a sense of, uh, of, of victimhood uh, and the counterpart to it, conspiracy. Um, which uh, becomes both internal, both becomes internal and external, uh, and then then the foreign plot during the terror, the two are there were two are, two are intimately tied together. You have a, a, a belief that you're being subverted uh, within France, uh, and your vulnerability to other other uh, to invasion from outside. These two things work 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 together with each other. Um, and by the 1780s, the French are beginning to believe that the system of alliances, which they've, they've constructed, essentially the, the, the system of alliances that have been constructed uh, uh, in the 1750s and the 1760s through these dynastic alliances with Spain and interdynastic alliances with Austria, these aren't really holding any longer. Um, they're no longer functioning as they did for several decades. Uh, and in 1788, Montmorin, the, the foreign minister, writes, France has no friends. If we would ever go to war, we wouldn't be able to count on anybody anymore. And it seems to me that's, a, that's an important sort of larger consideration uh, when true. It's in terms of what's going on during the revolution, right? Uh, and the attempt of France to recover from a period when it sees itself as growing exceptionally weak and exceptionally vulnerable. Which is in part why <clears throat> the Muslim world is really important because that's actually one of the few friends that France still right. has. Um, right. And in 1787, this is, I mean, this is really then circulating around these questions about Marie Antoinette and the Austrians. And I think it's on 30th of August, and this is something that Bob talks about, about the, the attempt to the attempt to uh, march on Versailles at that point. But these ideas that Austria is about to conclude a peace with Turkey and invade France <laughs> um, is part of the mobilizing effect. And I think, you know, what really it fascinated me about your work, Tom, too, is, is just the way in which as you know, the, 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 the way in which these external crises and internal crises become completely entangled in this period. Yes. And I'm just, I guess, 
do you see that as being specific to the 1780s being different from other periods? Well, I, there's, there was, there was rumors that, that Madame de Pompadour was already conspiring with the English. <laughs> so what I mean, it isn't, it isn't new. Uh, you find the earlier examples, but the question is the, the significance of it, right? I think the significance does grow in the 1780s and it comes from a sense of vulnerability. I mean, you, you've won a great victory with the American war, but now what? <laughs> How does France, that, that glory that France acquired as a result of the American Revolution uh, and the victory there is very rapidly lost. And, and in, in these crises, when France looks like it's growing weaker and weaker, and in terms of its relationship with Turkey, for example, which is something I know a little bit about, um, there, there, the problem there is the Turks are, are, are falling apart, right? Everybody's talking about the imminent dismemberment of the Turkish Empire, right? Which is only going to advance the interests of Austria and Russia uh, and lose France, one of its most important pivots uh, in foreign policy that it's been using since the 16th century. I think that's, you know, again, that's another reason to, for worry, concern, and sense of vulnerability. Yeah, I was really, I mean, what really struck me is just the presence because it's India as well is the is the other big issue and France's yeah. allies in India, <clears throat> which are also effectively Muslim allies. And so the presence around the same time of these of these uh, representatives coming on mission from Istanbul and also coming from India and effectively just pushing <laughs> these. I really felt that lightning rods for <laughs> discussion about what is wrong with the monarchy, why the monarchy is ruining France's place in the world. Right, right. A, va a vast discussion <laughs> uh, that I think lies behind a lot of discussions of the Enlightenment. I mean, why is France not, France is, it's, you know, it's described as the, a big country with a large population and lots of resources and all these wonderful things, great arts and sciences. Why are we losing? You know, and I think that question kind of hangs over the entire second half of the 18th century into the revolution. Why are we not doing better? And, um, and of course, there are going to be many different answers to it. But uh, it seems to be a general sort of question that provides a framework for lots of other, other issues. Yeah, and it seems, I mean, it seems like, it seems like some, of the, some recent historians, people like, Mike Alpor and Katie Jarvis are seeing a lot more of this politicization down to a much kind of more basic level amongst, well, particularly, I guess, in Paris, amongst the people of Paris. But <clears throat> I think we can see it. I think we can see it more generally. I mean, I think it's interesting in relation to what Justine says about how <laughs> ideas about reforming prostitution come into the, <clears throat> come into the Cahiers de Doléance be interesting to see which which specific cahier they come into um and i was just interested in this in relation to don's paper about saint lazare which i i, I thought was really fascinating <clears throat> and don you you said it's an incident hors série <laughs> um that doesn't really connect to a broader revolutionary narrative and i was just wondering whether are you are you going back to the Richard Cobbian idea of a magnificent irrelevance, or do you see it in more in the context of uh, people like Jean-Nicolas and, and Alpo and Jarvis who would see different forms of politicization, not necessarily the same form, but different forms of politicization amongst, the, amongst different levels of the people? Well, I'm, when I say that it's hors série, I'm taking it from the point of view of the general narrator, the person who writes the history of the revolution at the time and then uh, subsequent historians later who have very little place for the San Lazar sacking. And at the beginning of the paper, I go through quite a list of people who don't even, do not even mention it. It actually, actually surprised me when I did that research. So they're not there. And that's because I don't think they can make a lot of sense of it. And so it doesn't fit the narrative that leads from the sacking of Nekea down to write the, write the story of the sacking of Nekea down to the taking of the Bastille. You, you can successfully leave it out and still have a very satisfactory narrative of why the Bastille fell, why it was assaulted, and, and so on. I, I think from the point of view of ordinary people, it poses interesting questions of the degree of politicization that takes place. Um, 
that in, in some cases, I think there is a degree of politicization that goes into the sacking of San Lazar. That's a search, a search for weapons, and that originates in the, in the uh, Palais Royal, which is actually a short distance away. Um, others, in terms of the sacking, the, that doesn't make any sense at all from the point of view of the traditional narrative, but it does make sense for people who hate San Lazar. And since I wrote that paper, I've been doing some more research on why they hate San Lazar. And, okay. I, I come to the conclusion is because San is an immensely powerful institution. It's not just it's economically wealthy, it's politically connected. There was the Seigneur, for example. It was, it was the overlord of most of northern Paris. They owned a huge amount of property uh, in the northern part of the city around what is present day God the Less God. You know, that's sort of area there. Um, they, uh, they had a reputation for abusing their prisoners. They took prisoners on. Um, sometimes for family, sometimes for the state, and uh, they, took, they had a reputation for abusing their prisoners, but above all, they had, they, they fitted into a, a, and this is, I'm really working on this, it's very hard to get at, but I, th I think I have a way of doing it. saint -Lazare was an institution that was part of a network that the Intendant de Paris, Bertier de Sauvigny, had set up to assure the food supply of the city, abusing institutions like monasteries, which had immense storage space, store grain to release it as prices were to nudge prices down if they possibly could by controlling supply. And San Lazar was part of that process because it had a large process. But every single institution I come across like this where an institution or an individual was involved in the grain trade, they also were denounced as conspirators. And oddly enough, the most interesting example of that is Nekia was supposed to have saved everybody by his international dealings with the grain trade. Nekia is denounced as a chief order, a conspirator, a great trade, because it's a very dangerous place to be um, in, in the atmosphere of people. The fears that people had of being starved and being politically manipulated and being killed for their political reasons. <coughs> That's a form of politicization, which is a very powerful one. It's not the Declaration of the Rights of Man, it's not the regular revolution, it's not the limited government, um, anything like that, but it's a very powerful form of, of politicization and, and emotional commitment. That's, that's where I am in the new stuff. Well, I was wondering, uh, one part I didn't quite see how it fit, which was the attack on religious statuary at the, at the San Lazar. I mean, is this a religious act or sacrilegious act for a purpose, or is it just generalized, part of the generalized looting? Do you think there was significant? I, I think it's probably a religious act. I mean, I've, been, I've been doing some reading on iconoclasm <coughs> in the 16th century during the Reformation, where it certainly is the Calvinist iconoclasm of Catholic shrines, it's definitely a, a, religious, a religious act because it, these things are considered blasphemous and not justified by, by scripture. Um, I think the smashing of statues, as current events are going on now, the smashing of statues in the United States really means something to the people who are doing it, whatever, whatever you might think of it. Um, and similarly here, the, I think you have to pay attention to what statue is actually doing. Uh, what, what, um, and that's why I made this emphasis on the hands, what's happening with the hands. They, they, the text talking about smashing of the hands, smashing of the head, carrying the head around, parading the head around. I, the text is not there in the version you have, but I have discovered since. The head is taken to the Palais Royal and thrown into a fountain. And there's a connection there with the epicenter of revolutionary extremism. I, I think it has something to do with to uh, nullify the, the supernatural power of images in a Catholic culture. If it, was, if it was Edinburgh or Glasgow, it wouldn't have mattered. But uh, it does matter in a Catholic country like Paris. Yeah, I found that completely fascinating, really. And I mean, it's interesting. It's, I mean, thinking about it in a sense as a rhetoric of objects <laughs> is really... I think, you know, connects it into, into Bob's paper. And I guess I would be interested, Bob, how do you deal with, I mean, you're talking about these classical references. Does that mean that this kind of rhetoric is really <clears throat> at only at the level of kind of educated elites or are there ways of, I mean, I think maybe what Dawn is talking about gives us ways of thinking about, performative acts that might actually connect into these rhetorical strategies that are being used by by the elite 
deputies, for example? I think uh, that's a great question. Uh, the elites are definitely trying to reconfigure what the ordinary people of Paris are doing into something that they can, uh, they can make sense of with their educations. And uh, in some ways, I think it's a, it's a, a problematic disconnect that when they see uh, saint Rouge leading people toward them, they immediately think this is a purge and this purge is like other purges. And they, they, they don't think of it in terms of perhaps what Don is talking about, you know, linking it in better with histories of seigneurialism. Uh, it, it helps to remember that the, the people who are denouncing the Catalan conspiracy are, are men like uh, uh, Cocherel, who's uh, uh, from Saint-Domingue, and he's a, he's a slaveholder. And he's, he's, when he thinks of the, the populace, he has to have a very different understanding of what's going on in Paris based on his, his own, the disciplinary system in Saint-Domingue, where if people were behaving like this in Saint-Domingue, they'd be being burned alive. If people came around threatening the major property owners, and in Paris, this is functioning very differently. And so they're trying to get, uh, to get a sense of crisis focused on the individual deputies by bringing up the Catiline conspiracy. Uh, up until that point, up until uh, the uh, October days, there really hadn't been specific attempts to kill deputies. The Archbishop of Paris had been roughed up, perhaps, his carriage had been stoned. But when uh, they're talking about the throats of, of elite men being slit, uh, Delaunay, uh, Berthier de Sauvigny, these are elite men, but the, the deputies of the National Assembly are a different kind of elite men to them, that, and their training is making them think of them as these noble Romans. And I, I have to make a transition here to Linda and Marcia's paper. When they're talking about diplomats, they're talking very much about a noble, educated elite, people who have a, a very specific system of, of training and background that allows them to be credentialed, that allows them to move in certain circles. And they start their paper with a, a quotation by, that's actually discovered by the notable historian Thomas Kaiser. <laughs> that's a, that's Not to be a, trusted. <laughs> and they're referring to, Tom calls it, you know, a Ciceronian uh, language. And in, uh, in De Moulin's original article, he doesn't bring up Catiline. Uh, he brings up uh, Caesar and Antony. And so he's bringing up noble Romans who uh, have been away from the city, who are coming back as a threat. So I thought it was a really fascinating way for them to frame diplomats, that you send them away and they're, they're your creatures when you send them away. But when they return, they're their own creatures. The, so Desmoulins is framing diplomats as a threat, as people who may come back like uh, Dumouriez later does. You, know, you, you send them off with an army to do something and they come back with it. Uh, and in that sense, it, it, it brings them to Catiline, uh, a man who is a general who knows how to run an army, who goes away and is coming back to Rome. And that, that quote, that you know, the, the enemies are at the gates. You know, the, the enemy is not some stranger, it's actually you. It's actually people like you. Uh, and with, with Don's paper, it's the same thing, that those enemies that you're worried about in Paris, it's not strangers, it's not Austrians, it's, it's the people you, you interact with, uh, indirectly, but on a daily basis. Uh, oh, I actually have a question for you, Ian, if you don't mind. I was really fascinated by this invocation of uh, Robespierre as Muhammad, and especially with the way in which people who had been involved in Robespierre uh, in the project of the Committee of Public Safety uh, in the year two were able to uh, exculpate themselves, to get themselves out of trouble by, by claiming to have been innocent followers who had a greater idea in mind. I wondered what the knock-on effects were of, of besmirching Islam in this way if this led to problems uh, dealing with the, the Ottoman Turks or with the Persians in the future, if, the, if this amping up of anti-Muslim rhetoric uh, made it more difficult to maintain that alliance. So, I mean, it's fascinating because there's, <clears throat> there's this strange contradiction 
the the chief thing that they say about Robespierre is that he is an imposter like Mohammed, but without his genius. So <laughs> at this day, I mean, it's a, it's a double handed uh, way of representing Muhammad at this point in the sense of it's Voltaire's Muhammad, but it's also Muhammad, the, the historical figure who did actually succeed in founding a religion, which is a huge fundamental problem for, for the revolutionaries, which is what to do about religion. And that I think in the historiography, sometimes, I mean, at least in the, in certain forms of the, of the way of telling the story of the French revolution, religion just is a kind of secondary issue when in fact, you know, it's really at the heart of, and religion in general, not just the church, right? What do you, what are you going to replace Christianity with? Uh, is it going to be a civic religion? Is it going to be a different religion? And during, under the directory, this is an incredible kind of hothouse of talking about Islam. And I think, we, yes, we can definitely trace this fascination with Islam amongst young revolutionary thinkers, including Napoleon Bonaparte, who uses Islam to try to understand certain issues around his relationship to France as a Corsican, the, the, the relationship to religion and so on. And there is a distortion. It's not just anti, it's not an anti-Muslim rhetoric. It's also believing somehow that Muslims are naturally attracted to the revolution. And that is part of what leads Bonaparte to be convinced by this ridiculous plan of attacking France's only remaining kind of neutral or favorable power by invading Egypt. And then somehow that the Egyptians and the Ottomans in general would just accept that and join the revolution. So, and I think, I mean, I do believe that that is something that Talleyrand <laughs> understands very well and uses to his advantage. And when, when Bonaparte comes back, he scrawls all over Talleyrand's original proposition to invade Egypt, that this was complete and total madness. So yes, I do think it has an enormous impact on the future relationship between France and the Muslim world. I also have a question about your paper. Uh, so you mentioned that, um, that enemies of Robespierre would use the figure of Mahomet because it's a historical figure that people would have been familiar with. Uh, and I was just wondering to what extent, what did they know about him besides the fact that it was a negative connotation to use his name as a reference? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very good question. And I mean, who, who knew about it? Definitely in the same kinds of sets of references that Bob is talking about, this was a common reference, but it's a two-sided reference because you have Voltaire's Mohammed, and then you have the historical Mohammed who, uh, these figures in figures in Voltaire elsewhere, figures in Rousseau, figures, I mean, you know, most Enlightenment uh, writers are writing in some sense about, about Muhammad. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a lot of discussion around him as a figure, as the kind of the only true precedent for this massive change of religion that is taking place in France um, at the end of 1793. Um, so definitely these, I mean, the, this is the problem. And I guess this kind of runs through my whole book, which is that you have these multiple and often contradictory ways of representing Islam. And I guess this is a, this is the connection I see with what I think Bob is doing very importantly with the, with the Catalan conspiracy. The Catalan conspiracy doesn't mean just one thing. It is, it is a whole, it's a field of meaning. It's a field of meaning where certain operations can be carried out. And those are shifting. And I think this is something that we can really see very powerfully and which characterizes the revolutionary situation and makes it different from other situations, which is the rapidity and the instability 
of how these sets of references are used and changed that they from one day to the next <laughs> they can kind of change in in valency that's certainly true of Catalan, who to every figure, nature figure was accused of being at some yep. point. <laughs> I had a wonderful image that uh, I didn't use in my paper of uh, from either late 1794 or early 1795 of uh, Robespierre or the new Catiline. Right. It's, it's a severed head of, of Robespierre with all kinds of gore. And, yes. it, you know, and this is the denunciation. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, I cracked that a little bit from one, from one figure to the next, but not as systematically as you have. Yeah. But I was wondering, Bob, just a, a question on sources. You, you, you confined yourself to the Archive Parlementaire, the debates and the National Assembly. I'm wondering yeah. if you would think you'd find different uses of Catal Catiline conspiracy if you looked, let's say, more at pamphlets or, uh, for example, or newspapers, and whether that might be differently used differently in, in 1789 from the way you found them to be used. Definitely, and uh, stay tuned. I, I plan to give another paper uh, on this very subject. Uh, Camille Desmoulins had uh, yes. used the notion of the Catiline conspiracy in speaking about the events of the 30th and 31st of August, and he was responded to by the deputy Clermont Tonnerre, who, uh, and they get into a, what you could say is a, a pamphlet dust up over who the real Catilines are as well. Yeah. So it's well, there's also a source, a tremendous source, a tremendous amount of documentation in the petitions from Jacobin clubs following the fall of Robespierre in the ninth of Thermidor. Oh. The recent um, past, past 15, 20 years editions of the Archive Parlementaire. I've used them very, very fruitfully in some of my own work. Extraordinary amount of documentation gives you original opinion of it. Catalina is, 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 is uh, mentioned in at least one of the petitions I can think of because it's my little town of Oban that uh, they, they invoke it. So you would have thought that, that this is elite culture. But Oban is not an elite place. So it's, it's part of the general education, as you emphasize, Bob, people have that's part of their culture has since been lost to the rest of us. And so it's surprising when we see it, but not to them. Yeah, not to them at all. And it's, it's also, uh, it's out there in art as well. I mean, we, we're familiar with the elite artists, but uh, at the end of my paper, when I'm, showing my sources, it's uh, the painting that I have there is from 1783. And it's a terrible painting. But it's, it shows that, you know, Catiline was out there in a, in a way, it, paintings and etchings, that this, this was something that was uh, not just the province of the educated elite. Uh, you could definitely get a down market version of Catiline and down market versions of Plutarch. Okay. Well, I'd like to. I might want to talk about Linda's paper because apparently it's time to uh, wrap yeah, up. Time, time to wrap up. I'd like to thank the panelists for a very stimulating discussion. We all predicted that we weren't going to make it, make it to the time we did, and we exceeded the amount of time that we were given. <laughs> Thanks for our sponsors to uh, do that for us. It's been a very wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>